This is module two. Um, it focuses on prevention of maternal postpartum hemorrhage, and another word for that is readiness. So I think it's important to first uh, maybe move from the United States uh, to uh, Great Britain. Uh, this is a document uh, that's put out periodically um, and looks at confidential inquiries into maternal deaths in Great Britain. Um, we see that uh, maternal deaths from 2003 to 2005 were about six per 100,000, and then were decreased in 2006 to 2008 to about 4.7 per uh, 100,000. The decline that was seen uh, in the United Kingdom uh, really was felt to be predominantly due to a reduction in deaths secondary to thromboembolism, but also hemorrhage. And the point of this document that's put out every few years is really to improve the health care for mothers, their babies, and the children, and it's a good way to disseminate uh, the information. Now, some of the highlights of this document is, again, similar to what I talked about in the prior module uh, that happened in California. They noticed when they looked at the different cases of maternal demise in the United Kingdom, that they felt substandard care had been delivered in almost 70% of the direct deaths uh, that they noted. And uh, some of the reasons for that were uh, inadequate communication uh, between the patient, between health professionals, uh, lack of early identification of some serious medical conditions. And comments that they made uh, was, were that Recognition and management of severe acute illness in a pregnant woman really is a multidisciplinary uh, work. Having an anesthetist or a critical care specialist uh, involved early in these very specific cases of serious illness or when things are going bad um, really does help out. Other comments were that uh, careful clinical planning and management are likely to decrease high risk obstetric patients in developing life threatening conditions and severe maternal morbidity or mortality. So when I think about these patients, I think part of the problem is that the vast, vast majority of mothers who come through labor and delivery or pregnant women who come through labor and delivery rather, is that things normally go quite well whether you're at home or in a clinic, a midwifery clinic, or in the hospital, but it's really finding those patients that are likely to have issues um, and identifying them early, getting the right people involved that are gonna make the difference in reducing maternal mortality. So why is it so critical that we uh, see patients well before uh, they go into labor? I think it really gives us time to see who we need consultation from, if we need additional studies to be done, uh, whether laboratory or imaging, um, time to maybe coordinate care between some of the subspecialist groups, time to talk with experts uh, about options uh, that would be needed for that patient and the best way of care. And then in many cases, thinking about is the patient in the right setting? Um, if they were going to have the birth at home, should they move to a clinic or a hospital? If they you know, were already going to be at a hospital, is it a hospital that can adequately take care of them? Do they need to be brought to more of a tertiary care center or uh, a center that just has uh, more equipment and more staffing that might be better based on that patient's risk factors? So, I want to go back a little bit to the California experience that I was part of. So as we talked about before, um, in developing these toolkits or protocols for physicians to use in the state to improve hemorrhage care, uh, they first set up a survey uh, looking at what was going on in the hospitals and what could be done to improve the care. They noticed that within California in 2008, almost 50%, about 40% of hospitals did not have sort of a hemorrhage plan or protocol. Hemorrhage was defined inconsistently. Um, ongoing training from simulation and drills uh, was only being done in about 30% the vast minority of hospitals. And that a lot of the people participating in the drills, even when it was being done, weren't the actual physicians. It was more uh, nursing staff. Um, 
not all the hospitals had ad adequate access to uh, medications to uh, help tighten up the uterus after delivery, as well as surgical interventions or other invasive interventions to help treat hemorrhage when it occurred. So consequently, uh, the California Task Force uh, developed a toolkit uh, that they put online and made readily available uh, to the hospitals in the state. It talked about best practices. It had checklists for managing obstetric hemorrhage with flow charts and summaries, uh, practice guidelines, procedures, and a lot of training and teaching materials. And these toolkits still exist, and we'll talk about them on future slides. Um, the aim again of this whole effort was to really reduce the number of major complications associated with massive hemorrhage and uh, to try to develop and implement sort of a multidisciplinary team approach to every hemorrhage that went on in the state. So let's talk about the resources that are available from this effort. So if you were to go on uh, the web at www.cmqcc.org, and CMQCC standing for the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative, um, you would see these toolkits. And when you click on toolkit, uh, you can see there's toolkits for obstetric hemorrhage, preeclampsia, supporting vaginal birth. But if you click on the obstetric hemorrhage one specifically, you are taken to a page where you can download the toolkit for free. You just have to complete a very brief uh, survey. From this effort that occurred in California a few years ago, there was a spinoff of a more national effort by the United States called safehealthcareforeverywoman.org. And this is another resource available to uh, obstetric healthcare providers. And if you go to that link, you can see a variety of patient safety bundles, one of them specifically devoted to uh, obstetric hemorrhage. And if you go there, uh, that toolkit is divided into a variety of areas of readiness, recognition and prevention, response, and uh, reporting and systems learning to improve upon the care in future patients. I've kind of based my talk around these components that are part of the United States National Patient Safety Bundle. I think it's also important to know the WHO recommendations for preventing a postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, these you can find here with the link on the bottom of the slide. These recommendations came out in 2012 and they're being updated uh, this year in 2017. I was hoping the update would come out before I put this talk together. It has not yet, but I would anticipate it uh, any time. And I would look for it uh, whenever you're going to look up the WHO recommendations because there are likely to be uh, some changes. So, <clears throat> Again, uh, the components of uh, the remainder of these, this talk and these modules are broken down into readiness, recognition, response, and reporting. And the way this is developed are these are really safety bundles. Uh, they're not necessarily a national protocol. What they are is a toolkit that can be implemented at any hospital specific to the logistics and need of needs of care in that institution, and they can be tailored really to the resources available without being overly prescriptive. So let's start with readiness. So these are the components of readiness in the toolkit. One is trying to assemble a team that specifically responds to maternal hemorrhage that's multidisciplinary in nature from obstetricians, to blood bank, to nursing, to anesthesia, as well as pediatricians, neonatologists, other ancillary uh, support. Obviously, it's going to uh, vary from hospital to hospital what's available, but trying to gather as much multidisciplinary uh, partnership as you can. The second is having the right medications and equipment, meaning development of a hemorrhage cart um, with everything that you would need. Now, it could be a box, it could be a cart, um, but in addition to the equipment and medications, having actual instructions in uh, use of these items in a protocol specific to that institution is incredibly helpful. 
specific to the medications, having them readily available so they can be administered rapidly. As far as transfusion, having a massive transfusion protocol, assuming blood products are available at that institution so that they can be given in a timely manner in an appropriate way uh, with appropriate ratios of the different components and also uh, going through simulation and team training to keep everyone uh, involved in the care of these uh, laboring women uh, ready to go. So to go into further detail, I wanted to provide some examples. Um, this is a hemorrhage cart uh, in one of the hospitals in the US, and you can see that they have uh, quick access to emergency supplies in the drawers. They have a uh, refrigerator because many of the uterotonics, the medications that allow the uterus to tighten up need to be refrigerated. They have protocols hanging, uh, checklists, and um, it's all sort of ready to go. It can just be rolled uh, to the patient's bedside when the hemorrhage occurs. To give you more ideas of what you might want to put into a hemorrhage cart, and again, all of this can be found at either uh, the uh, either of the first two sites that I showed you for toolkits, but to just go through it, you see equipment such as retractors, speculums, uh, appropriate instruments, uh, curettes for removing um, tissue that remains in the uterus that might be causing the hemorrhage, uh, equipment to deal with the hemorrhage like intrauterine balloons, a hysterectomy tray, uh, appropriate diagrams even in case uh, the provider that is on when the mother is hemorrhaging isn't familiar with uh, certain uh, components of the equipment that would be needed. Medications mainly focused on the uterotonics, uh, from Pitocin to Methogen to Carboprost to Mesoprostol. Um, crystalloid, I would also argue, it's often on a different cart, but having it nearby is just a resuscitation cart for ACLS protocols with all the appropriate meds also nearby. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about checklists. Um, I've highlighted a checklist here that is provided by Stanford, um, and it is free for download. Uh, you can click on that and get Stanford's version of a checklist. I do encourage you, however, to go through this and take each checklist. There's 25 of them for uh, the critical events surrounding uh, obstetric care and try to tailor each one of them to your specific medical institution because as you know, each medical institution will have uh, a vast variety of resources and staffing uh, that you know, might cause this to be inadequate for that specific hospital and need to be uh, appropriately updated. So I'm gonna give you an example of uh, what we did uh, when I was at the University of California, San Francisco, uh, regarding a protocol specifically for obstetric hemorrhage. Uh, you can see initially uh, something to get people mobilized, sort of a call for help, a list of appropriate medications with their dosages, reminding people how to position the patient, how to get labs, how to activate different protocols that might be necessary, how to transfuse blood in appropriate component ratios, um, how to think about other ways to control the hemorrhage other than pharmacologic, uh, from intrauterine balloons to uh, brace sutures to calling interventional radiology for uterine artery embolization, not forgetting about uh, the possibility of a uh, hysterectomy, and then also other medications and differential diagnosis for the postpartum hemorrhage. This is an example of a flow diagram from the uh, California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative. And uh, it's a bit complicated. I don't expect you to be able to read it uh, in the amount of time I'm gonna spend on this slide. Just know that it is available for free for download. But it, the main thing with this is sort of a staged approach to maternal hemorrhage. You can see uh, things you should be thinking about from the time of admission, to if everything's going well, to the time rate after delivery when blood loss is typical uh, in some amount, but after it's clearing about 500 milliliters uh, with a vaginal delivery or a liter after cesarean delivery, uh, what needs to be done 
and how that response can be escalated with each stage as the blood loss increases. <clears throat> I want to move on a little bit um, to systems-based approach and simulation. Um, this is an article uh, that was put out a few years back, but it's really the idea that I think over the past 10 years, we've really changed the conversation in medicine to focus on changing systems rather than trying to point blame at a single healthcare provider and realizing there's a broad array of stakeholders in the care of these women and patients in general and trying to come up with effective, safe practices. Um, one of the highlights of this article was a comment that at least in uh, what they had studied uh, at these institutions that did team training and labor and delivery that they looked at, they noticed about a 50% reduction in adverse outcomes to preterm deliveries, um, just showing that you know, even specifically in labor and delivery healthcare, um, going through simulation and team training can make a big difference. I think that the practice of medicine is becoming more complex. Um, in order for it to be effective, it really is important to take this systems-based approach to think about teamwork, uh, team dynamics, and how things can be delivered in a safe, effective manner in an often dangerous environment uh, because of what can go wrong with the care or um, specifically to the patient and using a simulation uh, to improve the care. And again, it doesn't have to be high fidelity simulation. It can just be a simulation within that healthcare institution going through sort of mock drills of different um, maternal emergencies, uh, such as hemorrhage uh, from a variety of reasons to go through just the motions to see what's available, what would be needed to be changed in that institution to more effectively deliver care. This is a systematic review of the literature. It's a few years old now, but it looked at a variety of articles um, that examined uh, team training and simulation in the obstetric setting. What they noticed that was that simulation really did improve knowledge, clinical skills, communication, and performance um, in general, and they did have some improvement in clinical outcomes in one of the studies that they examined with improved uh, APGARs and a decrease in hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy of the newborns um, when the hospital's care teams had gone through simulation and team training. Now, <clears throat> one more article that I wanted to highlight was from 2006. It's not just enough to go through simulation and team training. The critical part of this really is in the feedback. This is a study that looked at simulation um, of care providers and uh, specifically looked at if no feedback was done, oral feedback versus video assisted feedback. They noticed no real difference in whether it was just a verbal sort of debrief after the simulation compared to a video assisted sort of more high fidelity approach. But they did note uh, that if no feedback was given, very little was learned from the simulation. So to just kind of summarize the past few slides, um, you know, simulation is critical to getting these skills uh, and knowledge imparted to the care team. It doesn't have to be high fidelity, but there does need to be some sort of debrief and specific feedback uh, at the end of the simulation. So thank you, and uh, I'll join you again at the next module.